without him. Dr. Philip Metzger is a planetary scientist with the Florida Space Institute at the Central Florida University, sorry, University of Central Florida, performing research and technology development related to planetary regolith. This includes developing robotics for planetary mining and construction. Formerly at NASA, he was part of the Space Shuttle Launch Team and then the ISS Development and Pre-Flight Testing Program. He co-founded the Kennedy Space Center Swamp Works, a rapid innovation center focused on planetary surface technologies. Metzger's research led to NASA's effort to protect the historic lunar sites, including the Apollo landing sites, from rocket exhaust blast descents. He was selected as Kennedy Space Center's scientist slash engineer of the year for 2011. He received the Astronaut Silver Snoopy Award in 2011 and NASA's Silver Achievement Medal in 2014. He was selected by ASCE, the Aerospace Division, for the Outstanding Technical Contribution Award of 2016. So I will turn it over to Dr. Metzger. Thank you. Um, so let me ask, are you seeing the full screen of the PowerPoint? Uh, we're seeing the PowerPoint itself, not not full screen. Okay. Presentation. Yeah, let me uh, go back out. And go back in. I'm just going to share the desktop. Give me one second. Okay, so do you see the full screen of the PowerPoint now? Yes, we That's can. Good. Yes. Awesome. Okay, and let's see if I can get this out of the way. No, I guess I can't. Um, all right, well, good enough, I guess. Okay, so I'm gonna to talk today about the 21st century. Um, okay, that's better. 21st century, what great things we will do. It's truly an exciting time if you're in engineering and especially working on technologies related to space, which includes almost every technology. Um, so let's just get started in this. Um, I'm gonna start out by talking about Alexei Kardashev. He was a Russian physicist. I, I think he's still alive, but earlier in the prior century, he was looking for signals of alien civilizations. And he started talking, he wanted to get people to realize that if we ever did see an evidence of an alien civilization, it might not look like our own. Um, and so to get people thinking more creatively, he created the scale that we call the Kardashev scale of civilizations. And um, the, the whole purpose of this is just to stretch our minds to think that things might be different. How could things be different than what we know right now? He described a type one civilization as one that uses the energy of an entire planet. Later on, Carl Sagan converted that into a logarithmic scale, and Carl Sagan calculated that we are a 0 0.7 scale civilization on, on a logarithmic axis. Um, so we're not quite using the energy of an entire planet, but we are pushing that boundary where we're starting to hurt the planet on a global scale, um, or starting to affect things globally. So then a type two civilization would be one that uses the energy of an entire star. That might be, for example, if you build a Dyson sphere or a Dyson swarm around a star to capture all the energy coming out of that star. In practice, no civilization would really wanna do that, but, but it's just an idea to give you a sense of what might be possible. And then a type three would be a civilization that uses the energy of an entire galaxy. So that's thinking way out there, but why not? You know, that it's possible, so why not? Um, and I've just gone through these, so. Um, now, skipping ahead, we are uh, growing. We've been growing exponentially. We're starting to taper off in terms of human population. This is a prediction that comes from the United Nations predicting that we're gonna top off at over 11 billion people by 2100. Um, but although the number of humans is gonna top off, the amount of intelligence in our civilization is not predicted to top off. Um, we are showing uh, in increasing use of artificial intelligence for more and more functions, for more and for more benefit in civilization, doing simulations of protein folding and aircraft flying. You can do simulations of 
um, battles before a war, but you can likewise do simulations of politics. We have a lot of artificial intelligence predicting the behavior of consumers, and there's no end in sight for the growth of, of artificial intelligence or equivalent minds in our civilization using energy. And the way that we're headed right now, there is an economic driver to coat the planet with machinery. Um, the predictions uh, of where we're going to go in terms of energy are all over the map. Um, um, they're all over the map, but um, so I took a, a survey of 133 studies predicting the future energy needs of our world. Um, these were all the energy studies that were published after a certain climate study a few years ago. And so I plotted them in terms of percentiles of predictions. So if you're a conservative engineer, you're not going to build a bridge that has no margin. If you want to build a civilization that has enough margin to handle the predicted energy needs, I mean, minimal conservatism, you're going to, you're going to want to plan for more than 50th percentile re, um, requirements. And so we're talking about quadrupling the energy needs of our planet by the end of the century. And um, quadrupling the energy needs doesn't just mean quadruple the energy, it means quadruple the machinery burning the energy, quadruple the supply chain, the entire industrial supply chain four times over. And so we're talking about four times more burden on our planet. And so this is a, a problem. You know, We want the whole world to have the benefits of technology. We, we know there's a correlation of economic development with healthcare, with quality of life, with equality for all people in humanity. There is a definite correlation. Um, and so how do we deliver all these benefits while without burdening our planet four times more than we are today? And that's, remember that's just about 50th to 60th percentile. And a lot of studies are saying it's gonna be a um, hundred times more energy. Um, but so the, the, the answer is that we have to think outside the sphere. Um, we always hear think outside the box, but in this case, our box is a sphere. We usually think that our world is a planet. And so when we talk about living sustainably, we artificially box ourselves into the surface of this sphere. And we don't realize that we live in an incredibly rich solar system with literally billions of times more capability than what we have in our planet. And Earth is a beautiful place for biology. It's a beautiful place for ecos the ecology of living organisms. But machinery, the machinery that drives our civilization does not need the special features of planet Earth. So why are we filling up our planet with machines when those machines could quite easily be outside the planet yet still support civilization inside the planet? And as I said at the top, our greatest resource is not the materials or the energy of our solar system. It's our imagination to think outside the sphere and to find ways to do this. Um, a few years ago, it was actually 2009, NASA crashed a spacecraft into the moon in Cabea's crater. A friend of mine, Tony, Tony Colaprete, was the principal investigator, and he picked the impact spot. And he said, I just picked the coldest spot on the moon. And when they crashed that spacecraft in, it blew up a big ejecta sheet that was filled with about, about eight and a half percent ice, 5% um, water ice and about three and a half or four percent of, of lots of other kinds of ice, carbon dioxide, ammonia. And a friend of mine, Tony, Tony Colaprete, who was an NASA scientist at the time, said, now we know, now that there's carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen on the moon, now there is nothing that can't be made on the moon. So we know that all the resources we need to start an industrial supply chain outside of this precious planet Earth is right next door in our nearest neighbor. We also have asteroids that have everything we need and we can bring them and park them in orbit. Um, but is this possible? Can we actually trans, uh, transport the, the backbone of civilization back and forth across the empty ocean of space. Well, if you went back a few hundred years, just a few hundred years ago, and asked people of the world, is it possible to do economic activity across the vastness of our ocean, they would have laughed because crossing the ocean was a heroic, epic journey. And a few people back 400 years ago or 500 years ago, 
Like for example, a few people in the Hawaiian islands had crossed the ocean three times in their life. So it was doable, but it was not the sort of thing you would incorporate into the routine business of running a civilization. But now we cross the ocean like it's no big deal at all. If I go on Amazon and I click a few buttons, suddenly a, a little toy will be put into one of these containers automatically by a robotic factory, a warehouse. It'll go into one of these boxes, it'll get put on a ship and the ship will cross the ocean. And a week or so later, it'll show up at my doorstep. And it's no big deal crossing these oceans anymore. So we know that humanity is actually pretty good at going from level to level in the scale of civilization. And that's why we've come to this point that we're pushing the limits of our planet. And so it's really not gonna be an impossible thing to cross the next ocean as well. We just need to use our imagination. And like any big engineering problem, we need to break it down and solve the, solve the mechanism for how to do that. Now, back in the 1990s, and early, actually starting in the 1970s, Gerard K. O'Neill was a physicist at, at Princeton. And he started looking at how do we take the economic backbone of civilization and start extending it into space. And so he imagined these large rotating cylinders with artificial gravity inside where you would have 10,000 workers in one of these cylinders and they would be doing manufacturing. You would send up, a, uh, send up material from the moon. They would be doing all the manufacturing and creating these systems that capture sunlight and then beam the sunlight down to earth. So the, the export from their, their little um, habitat that they would sell to the people of earth would be energy and they would make money that way. And that's how they could buy things from earth. And so he was starting to look at how do we do um, basic economic trading with communities in space. But in order to make that work, you would need to have 10,000 people living inside one of these habitats. According to his estimates, until you had 10,000 people living in one of these giant cylinders, it would not break even, you would be losing money. And so trying to get the capital to raise, uh, raised to build one of these facilities uh, with so much risk it just seemed too impossible back in the 1970s through the 1990s. And so people started to say, well, it's just crazy. And, you know, don't even think about that anymore. Um, but like I said, any big engineering project, it, it seems impossible if you are not part of the team that does it. This is why we talk about the great wonders of the world. It's a wonder because you weren't on the engineering team that did it. If you were on that team, yeah, it's still a wonder, but you know how it happened because you broke down the requirements, you broke it into subsystems, you developed the processes and you did it. You put it together piece by piece. And so these amazing things like this gigantic bridge has been actually built. And like these skyscrapers made out of glass and steel. This is, if you had gone back a thousand years ago and, and showed a picture of this, people would have thought you were crazy to talk about doing such a thing. And yet here we are doing it. Or the Large Hadron Collider, which is spinning particles at so close to the speed of light that special relativity and general relativity are, are important in the physics of how these particles collide. And we have to, fling these particles with such precision and yet we're doing it you know we actually built these things and we can do it now and look at this skyscraper this tremendously giant skyscraper and rockets the heat and the energy and all the electronics and yet we did it and it's done just like any engineering project by breaking down the requirements and doing a requirements flow down breaking it into subsystems solving all the little pieces piece by piece and so in the 1980s, NASA said, well, let's, let's take Gerard K. O'Neill's idea about factories in space, but let's try to break it down. And they said, we're gonna need robotics because we're not gonna start out with 10,000 people, that's too expensive. Maybe with robotics, we can do it. And they started talking about self-replicating lunar factories. And they did a really nice study in about 1979, 1980, where they scoped out a factory and they said for about hundred tons of hardware, this factory could build 80% of its own parts, 80% of the mass of its own parts. And you could send the other 20% from earth. Um, and for only 20%, you can double this thing. And so you can start to replicate it and scale it up. And then over time, you can start to work towards 100% closure. 
Um, but again, it was before its time, it seemed a little crazy. The artificial intelligence wasn't available and trying to convince people to build a hundred ton factory to fly to the moon was just not in the realm of doable. It was not politically doable at the time. It was not economically doable. There was no business case. And so a few years ago, I started working on um, the, the use of a, another approach, a bootstrapping approach, where we would um, build a little bit on the moon and launch a little bit, build a little, launch a little. And over time, we would slowly build up a factory. So um, you would send your first generation lunar fabrication lab to the moon. You'd extract materials from the moon and you would build some easy to make parts. And then you send some more equipment, some high tech stuff that you can't build on the moon and then make some more stuff. And over time, you're making more and more of the parts and you're sending less and less. And over time, you evolve it into being a complete lunar supply chain. So rather than start out building the entire factory and launching the whole thing, let's evolve it in place with support from the earth. And over time, we get there. And so that gives us the chance to break it down into a series of bite-sized engineering problems. It also allows us to break it down into a, bite, a series of bite-sized economic problems because we don't have to build the whole thing at once. We can work on little pieces and try to build a business case for each piece. But once you get there, you build, got the supply chain on the moon, you can scale it up, it can rapidly extrapolate itself and replicate itself and then build every, anything you want and support the earth um, what would this factory look like? Well, you would mine the, the rock on the moon to extract oxygen, silicon, metals, calcium, the rare elements. You would mine the ice at the poles of the moon. You would get out the water, the carbon dioxide, the nitrogen, and the other molecules. Then we would do materials processing. With those materials, you would do manufacturing. You would do construction of facilities. You would manufacture solar cells, fabrication hardware, assembly robots. The solar cells would power the whole thing. And so as you're scaling it up, you're providing the power for each next level. Um, the then you would begin to provide benefits to humanity. Early in the process, you could begin to make rocket fuel as one of the early products that would help develop a cash flow to support it. And you would also support doing science on the moon. Um, so I did some modeling about, uh, it was in 2011, 10 years ago, I, I wrote a computer model of the, of the um, bootstrapping of industry on the moon. We started out with a first generation fab lab, the mass, the power, and the throughput rates of the hardware were all based on actual equipment that we built at NASA. And so this was not just making up numbers, but we did have to extrapolate um, somewhat. But I think it's a fairly credible first generation. And um, from that, I, I modeled how you would bootstrap it toward a, toward a full generation. It would be seven generations because there's a 2.5 in there. There's a reason for that. I don't want to spend the time to discuss. But in seven generations of hardware, you would end up with um, 100,000 tons of hardware on the moon and 60,000 robots, it would be 60,000 tons of hardware on the moon. And um, uh, yeah, 60,000 tons of hardware and about 100,000 robots doing all the assembly. And um, it would only take about 60 tons of mass that you would launch to the moon to get there. And it would take about 20 to 40 years. I think 30 to 40 years is a really conservative estimate in how much time it would take to do this. And it would, it would only take about a third of NASA's budget. So it's very doable. Um, and what would we get out of this? Well, we could build space-based solar power systems to beam down all the clean energy the earth needs the entire supply chain of the energy sector would be off the planet, including all the mining and manufacturing that supports the energy sector. We could put most of the internet servers in space and all the high power computing, which, which doesn't mind a short um, communications latency of a couple of seconds, um, which would be the vast majority of all the computing in our world. And those two things alone, the majority of the computing sector, including the manufacturing that supports it, and the energy sector, those two things alone are gonna be more than half of the industrial footprint by the end of our century. So right there, the only things that have to be transported from space down to the earth are just photons. So you're not gonna be landing manufactured goods from space. So it's very doable. 
And just those two things alone can unburden the Earth's environmental burden by half. We can also do planet or more. We can also do great planetary defense by owning all the asteroids, knowing where they all are, mapping them, putting beacons on all of them, and making Earth safe for all species. We can um, create transportation hubs and spacecraft to travel throughout the solar system and beyond. We could put outposts on all the planets and all the moons of the solar system. We could build great telescopes. For example, Seth Shostak at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California, wrote a paper where he argued that if you put a, a bunch of telescopes in orbit around the sun at the same distance that the earth is from the sun and made them into a phased array telescope, that telescope would be able to take a photograph of a mid-sized automobile on a planet a hundred light years away. So but having such a large aperture telescope, even a phased array made out of many little telescopes, you could do amazing astronomy. And so if there are any civilizations within hundred light years, we could look at them. We could see the cars driving around on their roads. And by the, the inverse of that, if there are any civilizations within hundred light years of us, and if they're just one century ahead of us in their technology, then they're looking at us and they're seeing what we were like. They're seeing the Model Ts driving around on the cars from 100 years ago here on the earth. So, um, so there are amazing things that we can't imagine yet that will become possible once we take civilization beyond the limits of a planet where we're no longer constrained to the industrial supply chain that can fit within a planet. Um, we could terraform other planets and we could build giant tra traversing world ships to other stars. We could build spore ships that would go to other stars, set up mining in their asteroid belt and terraform planets so that when we arrive, there's already planets you could live on. So there's amazing things we can do. Um, but let's talk about how do we break this down into achievable steps? Okay, so uh, a few years ago, we had a field test on Mauna Kea in Hawaii and we called it dust to thrust. You can see the dust right here. We were dumping dust, which was scooped up off the volcano. This rover was dumping it into a pneumatic conveyor system, which moved the soil into a processor, which then used sunlight to melt the, melt the dust. And it reacted it with methane as a, as a recyclable reactant to extract oxygen. And that oxygen went over to this tent where it was liquefied and it was used to fire a rocket engine. So it was dust to thrust and it worked, it was great. Um, so there's the solar cells concentrating the sunlight. There's the reactor which, which extracted oxygen from the dust. We've done reduced gravity flights. These are some of the people in a lab that I used to run testing the reactor systems where you flow the dust into the reactor and flow it back out. And we proved it worked at lunar gravity. Um, we've also done some work on on how do you build landing pads on the moon or Mars. And so these are simulated lunar soil, simulated lunar soil that we centered and we strapped it onto this landing pad and massed and space systems flew their rocket over it. Um, we had a big robotic arm 3D printing with simulated lunar soil. So that it was making this glassy material because it was using an infrared laser and it was melting the soil. Um, so these are just some examples of the type of work that's going on. And the reason NASA is doing this kind of work is because there's the potential to make exploration cheaper. And that's, um, that's something less than an economic activity. You know, exploring is non-economic. We, we explore by investing taxpayer money for the good of the exploration itself, even though we're not getting back an economic product from it but there is a desire in our society to do exploration. And so that creates the opportunity to develop some of these technologies, which will later on contribute to doing full-scale civilization off the planet. Um, we have robotic competitions and you can see I've got the 2018 University of Alabama robot right there. I love showing videos of that robot. One of the greatest examples I know about how students are making a significant impact in space technology. I mean, I'm still blown away by the capability of that robot. That was amazing. I was blown away. I loved it. Uh, but there's so much diversity of thought, so much creativity in the types of robotics. And we are really learning from this. Every year I go to this competition and we take notes and we ask ourselves, why do some robots get stuck and some robots don't get stuck? And we've learned a lot about it. And so this is going into helping NASA to advance the technologies. 
Another area um, that I'm gonna focus on for a few minutes is landing pad construction. I think there's going to be a business case in the near term for building landing pads on the moon driven by geopolitics because we don't want our nation's lunar landings to sandblast the Chinese hardware. And we don't want the Chinese landings to sandblast the US hardware. And so in order to solve the geopolitical issues of damaging each other's hardware, I think there's an opportunity for companies to develop these technologies and build landing pads. And so this will help move the ball down the field towards getting industry in space. It's a simple step, but it is a real step. So I've done some work for the Jet Propulsion Lab, scoping out how big a landing pad needs to be. We broke down the requirements to the inner zone where it's hot, the outer zone where it's not hot, but you have to stop erosion. Um, we've looked at different technologies like using concentrated sunlight to center the soil, didn't work too well. Using microwaves, you get, you get better depth of penetration, but it's really high energy. We've looked at using infrared um, convective or conductive I'm sorry, resistive heating elements to center the soil using an additive process. We had issues with process control, but it basically worked. It needs more work to make it better. Um, we looked at using pavers. Pavers have a problem in the, in the center of the landing pad. The gas goes between the cracks, gets under the pad, and then explodes the pad. So we need to improve the, the interlocking nature of the pavers and grouting methods, but we made progress in this. A method that a friend of mine, Paul Van Sassante at Michigan Tech, has been developing is, um, is using storm breaks. I think that's what they're called. It's a, it's, a technolo it's a method used in civil engineering where you pile up the sand or pile up the rocks from small to large, and the larger rocks hold down the next smaller size rock all the way down to the fines. And so Paul was working on using rocks to build the outer zone of the landing pad. Um, we also looked at using polymer application where you simply bring polymer to the moon, mix it in the soil. We've done tests with hot jets on the polymer to study how, how they degrade under the high temperature. And so I've, I've used all of these technologies to do a trade study and I'm just gonna go to the final result. So in the trade study, it looks like some of these middle versions, three, four, six, and seven look like the best ones. So either centering or papers in the middle of the landing pad and either polymer or gravel on the outside of the landing pad. And so um, there's still a lot of work going on in these areas, but there are a number of people writing proposals, trying to advance the technologies. And I'm hoping pretty soon we're gonna have some private companies building infrastructure on the moon in order to support international exploration at outposts on the moon. And that'll be a business case for some companies. It's, it's still, an, it's a business case supported by taxpayer funded exploration and science. Um, and so it's still not a consumer driven business case in space. But now I wanna talk about the next thing I think is a good business case, which is a consumer driven business case. And that is making rocket fuel in space. I'm gonna check the time to see how we're doing on time. Um, okay, 7.30. All right, so, um, so a few years ago, there was a study at the International Space University called OASIS. I forget what it stands for, but it was something about, um, about building spaceports in space, infrastructure in space. And so they talked about having a spaceport, a node one, which would be in low Earth orbit, and the spaceport would provide services like refueling. And then you could have a node two on the moon, you could have a node two, three on Phobos to support Martian operations, and they looked at what could node one do in low earth orbit. Well, one of the things it could do is have a space tug and the space tug could be refueled repeatedly. And then it can mate up with a spacecraft that was thrown into low earth orbit and it could deliver that spacecraft to its final operational orbit. The space tug can then go get refueled and do it again. And so you can start to provide a service and this service is delivering commercial satellites and you can reduce the cost of delivering satellites to their final operational orbit by doing this. Um, if you can reduce the cost of delivering satellites, you're reducing the cost of Netflix and Crunchyroll. And so you end up providing a consumer good that is driven by the commercial markets. Now, where do you get the, the fuel to refuel that spacecraft? Well, you can get it in space. Um, and so they looked at how you, how you would build this depot in low earth orbit. 
Um, they, uh, they scoped out the mass of it, the cost of it. They looked at putting a node on the moon where you're actually making the rocket fuel. And um, it looked like a pretty good story. Like uh, it didn't quite close the business case, but it was getting close. We needed to make more progress. So more people have been working on this idea. A friend of mine, George Sowers at the Colorado School of Mine has been proposing new ideas where he was looking at beaming sunlight from the rims of craters on the moon down into the permanently shattered craters, using that sunlight to melt the soil. And he hired me to do some, um, he, he gave me a grant at the University of Central Florida to do some of the modeling for this. And so we've been modeling how do you extract the water ice from the soil using a very simple technology to lower the cost. Um, so I've been doing some work through a NIAC grant on a new concept that I came up with to hopefully lower the cost even more. And so my idea is let's start with the minimum viable product, the smallest operation that you can get away with. And so one of the ideas is get rid of the propellant depot in low earth orbit, at least for the start. And later on, after we've established this business, we can then later build the propellant depot, which will improve the profitability. But for now, it would look like this. You'll mine water on the moon. You'll, um, so a company like SpaceX will throw a spacecraft into an initial orbit. So this is supposed to represent geostationary transfer orbit, but it could be low Earth orbit or anything else. So they throw the spacecraft into a GTO. Now the old way they would do it, or actually the way they do it now, is they include a, um, a thruster on the spacecraft. And over a period of six to 12 months, that thruster slowly raises the perigee until it reaches the operational orbit. And it takes six to 12 months for that spacecraft to get to its final orbit. And during that time, it's losing revenue that it could be making because it's not operational till it gets there. It takes six to 12 months. That means it loses about $100 million in revenue. But during that same time, you're paying all the costs, finance charges, you're paying operational costs, insurance charges, the spacecraft is wearing out, the technology is getting older. And so it's a real loss. This $100 million is a real loss. And so if we can get it to its final operational orbit in less than $100 million and get it there in about a day, then that's a real profit. So here's the idea. You mine water on the moon and your space tug leaves the moon and goes all the way to the earth without a depot. It drops into geostationary transfer orbit. Perhaps it uses air braking to make it more efficient. Then the spacecraft from the Earth launches, rendezvous with the space tug, and in one day the space tug burns its high thrust engines, circularizes the orbit. The space tug then flies back to the moon and lands and refuels. And so the question is, can we do that in less than $100 million? Because if we can, then we have a business case. And so we're looking at a very simple way to extract oxygen or to extract water from the moon using a scooping process where we simply scoop the soil up. We expect based on the physics, based on the geology and based on data that we have from the moon, um, this is controversial, but I think this is the correct conclusion that the ice is probably very fine grained granular mixed in with other grains. And therefore we can use a beneficiating process using magnetic and electric fields and pneumatics to separate the ice from the other grains. You can dump the silicate grains on the ground and then you can haul the water ice out into the sunlight and then you can um, do the electrolysis and the water cleanup and put it into your space tug out in the sunlight where you don't need lots of infrastructure to transport the energy. So our initial analysis of this is that we can build an entire mining outpost for eight tons of hardware instead of hundreds and hundreds of tons of complex equipment that needs to be matured. So in other words, we can send an entire mining operation to the moon on one lander. And that means we can start to, we can start to operate, create revenue, mature the technology, and then we can scale up smoothly, buying down the risk as we're operating. And so that's the whole idea of having a minimum viable product. That you improve it as you go along and you get an early start. So this, I think, is progress, real progress to starting the virtuous cycle of industry and space, and then we can begin scaling it up. And so those are just a couple of ideas about how we're starting right now in developing the industry. But I want to I say 
What we need is a lot more creative thought, creating additional business cases for things that you can do in space. There's tourism, there is making additional products in space, there is um, making things you can bring back to the earth, there is um, supporting exploration, supporting science, and a lot of other creative ideas. Every one of these is a stepping stone towards full industry in space. And once we start to create this business case, this um, supply chain on the moon, I think within 30 to 40 years, we can get to a full supply chain and then rad radically scale it up and radically transform the nature of civilization. And so that means it's happening right now in your career, in the span of your career is when this is gonna happen. So conclusion, why do we need to do this? Well, if you look at all the planets and moons in our solar system, one stands out as unique, different than all the rest. It's that planet that you see that has water that's in vapor, liquid and ice form at the surface, which has dry land and oceans and ecospheres and it supports life. Um, all the other planets lack that sort of diversity. It lacks the Goldilocks conditions for life. And so that one planet is special. That one planet needs to be a planet that we preserve where we keep it good for life, keep it good for biology. And the machinery of our civilization, we can begin putting into space. And so this needs to be done and needs to be done rapidly. Time is of the essence. But um, we have a lot of space in space. And the greatest resource in space is not the metal on the moon. It's not the water on the moon. It's not the energy of the sun. It's space itself. It's the space where we can put the machinery, keeping them off of our planet. And so we need to start thinking that our world is more than just a planet. Our world is the whole solar system. And we're gonna begin extending our civilization outward into this great world that we have. And, and so we are near the limits of a planetary civilization. We may not technically achieve type one civilization where we use all the solar energy that falls on the earth. Um, we may not achieve that until we get outside the earth. I mean, I hope we don't achieve type one civilization while we're still bound to an, one planet. Because if we did, if we took all the energy of our earth, then it would kill off all the plants and all the animals. So we need to get beyond the limits of a planetary civilization if we wanna to go to type one, type two and, and beyond. But we can do this. We can move this beyond this planetary limit and it's happening now. So I hope those are some inspiring words for you. To, to let you know that this is a really cool time to be an engineer. It's a really cool time to be a space technologist, to be a roboticist, to be, um, to be an aerospace, mechanical, electrical, to be in business. It's a good time to be in art, to communicate the vision of what we're doing in space. It's just an exciting time overall. So um, I've, I think I've saved enough time that I can answer some questions now. That would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, the ideas that you've been throwing out are everything that we're excited about. So thank you very much for coming to speak to us. We do have some questions. Um, Dr. Ricks asks, what are your ideas about the first few Artemis missions? Okay, so um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways I could try to answer that. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about the Artemis program. Uh, I mean, we've had lots of in-house arguments and disagreements over what it should be like. You know, people have said, we should not use SLS, we should use SLS, we should not have gateway, we should have gateway, you know, gateway should be in low lunar orbit, it should be in, be in near rectilinear halo orbit. You know, there's been arguments all over the place about how to do it. But um, to me, the most important thing is that we do it, um, get going on it. And um, so I would rather not argue those details. I would rather just go with what's politically viable and make it start happening now. Um, now, when it was first announced, when it first came out that uh, it was gonna be in 2024, I was interviewed about it. And I went on record right from the start saying that I don't think we can really do 2024. But I said, I think it's a good goal. And, even though I don't think we're gonna make it, I think it's important to have a short goal in order to light a fire under us to get us moving fast. 
So I would rather not move the goal out. Um, some people are saying 2028 should be the goal. I would rather keep it closer than that. I mean, I think it's a, it's a given we're not gonna make 2024, but I would rather slip it year by year and keep the fire on to make it happen faster. Um, if it were up to me, I would probably skip the gateway. Um, I, I think gateway could be really cool. It would be especially cool if we turn it into a propellant depot, um, but, uh, but that's just an in-house argument. You know, ultimately, if we have a gateway or don't have a gateway, I'm in favor of it either way. And right now the politics are lining up for us to do the gateway, so let's do it. Um, I don't know if I, asked, if I answered your question, but uh, I'll take a follow-up if you want. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, this next one is actually from me. Uh, are Gerard O'Neill's ideas any more feasible now than they were in the 70s? And what would your ideal space settlement look like? Yeah, um, so I think they are. Um, see, when Gerard O'Neill in the 70s was, was doing his work, he was largely ignoring the future role of robotics. And that was because you couldn't really foresee um, the future role of robotics. It was at that time, robots were science fiction. Um, but we are now in well into this robotics revolution. There are factories on the earth. There are literally right now factories on the earth that are operating where there are no humans in the factory tonight. And there won't be any humans in the factory for the next three weeks. You know, they, they're called lights out factories and they turn off the lights, they turn off the air conditioning and a month later, the people come back in. Now, um, the, these lights out factories are making everything from beer to robot arms. And um, now part of the reason they work is because they put a bunch of spare robots in there. And so when a robot breaks, the robots will pull off the line and a spare will take its place. You know, they're not fully automated Star Wars type robot factories like on Geonosis. You know, it's nothing like that. But the fact is we have factories with no humans inside them. And so, um, we have come a long way to making space industry economically viable in space. The key issue I think that's remaining, well, there's two key issues. Issue number one is creating business cases that will allow us to, to um, bootstrap the supply chain in a piecemeal fashion, rather than saying we need to deliver the entire supply chain all at once because it's hard to convince anybody to put that much money into a risky venture all at once. So we need to break it down into bite-sized business cases. I think that's the one real problem. The second problem, I don't have any real concern with because I, I, we don't need it solved for another 20, 30, 40 years. And that is the amount of artificial intelligence that we need in the robotics. Um, right now, robots are great for structured environments. And that's why we have lights out factories. They're highly structured. There's nothing unknown in that environment. Um, but when you guys built that robot to operate in the regolith, you had to put machine learning in it to handle unknown situations. Like you don't know exactly where the rocks and the craters are gonna be. Okay, so that's the key issue. Artificial intelligence and robotics to work in unstructured environments. We need progress in that field, um, but we really don't need that progress for 20, 30, 40 years. And it's gonna be happening during the, as we're bootstrapping industry in space, I expect that those advancements are going to be made. So um, as we solve the economics and as we work on the engineering over the next 20, 30, 40 years, I think we're gonna get there. And so uh, how do we build these big giant living places that O'Neill talked about? Well, I think you have to get the, the supply chain in place first. Once you've got the supply chain and it's adequately robotic so that you don't have humans turning all the wrenches, then the cost comes down so low that you can do wild stuff like that. And, and so the kind of big wild engineering that is possible is going to be um, solved as an economic engineering problem bit by bit. Um, but I, I totally believe we're going to get there this century. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Mason. Have you seen the TV show The Expanse? What do you think of its vision of the future of humanity? 
yeah so i love that show um but season one uh when i started watching it it i was like whoa 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 wait a minute where are the robots because i couldn't imagine that you're going to be mining chunks of ice from the rings of saturn where it's entirely human labor you know where humans are doing everything and getting their arms chopped off and stuff like that you know um so I, I tweeted about it, just joking around, like, where are the robots? And then a friend of mine, Joel Sircell, who has an asteroid mining company, he tweeted it. And he's like, yeah, where are the robots? And he copied, um, he copied the expanse, uh, the writers of the books. I, I forget the guys, the two people's name, what the pseudonym they go by. But he copied them on it. And they actually tweeted back at us. And they said, well, um, if you want to, you can write the boring but technically accurate version. So <laughs> it was pretty funny. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a story about human drama. And so they wanted to emphasize humans. And so they downplayed the role of the robotics. Um, so taking that into account, okay. Other than that, I love it because it does bring out a lot of issues that are real issues that we're going to have to address as we move forward into space. And I think there are some real societal issues that we're going to have to deal with. Um, I was just, I'm not caught up on this season, but I noticed they finally had a robot um, doing something in one of this, one of the uh, first few episodes of this season. I was like, yes, they finally got a robot. So um, those are my thoughts about it. Thank you very much. We have a question from Aiden. Do you know if NASA or any companies you know of are looking into developing skyhooks or similar technology? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, these kinds of technologies, not just sky hooks, but elevators like lunar elevator. The lunar elevator is technologically feasible. You know, the Earth space elevator is still kind of outside what's doable today um, by most accounts. But lunar elevator would be, I mean, you could build one today. You could use a fiber like Spectra. You wouldn't need anything exotic. You could go, you could go to a commercial vendor and buy the material and build a space elevator on the moon. And then skyhooks, um, for those who don't know, a skyhook is similar to a space elevator, except it's not a static elevator that you climb all the way. Instead, it's an orbiting vehicle that has a, a like a pinwheel of, of tethers that dip down. And so I don't know if you could do this on the earth. I guess from an airplane, you could, you could grab the hook, but on the moon or another airless body, you could very easily have a tether swing down. And as it swings by, it grabs your robot or you grab the tether and it just pulls you up and then you let go and it flings you into orbit. So it's a way to get to space from a, a large gravity body without rockets. Um, so uh, it's a cool idea. And I think it's well within technical feasibility um, it's just a matter of the business case. You know, you've got to find investors who want to put the money into it. And so you've got to have a commercial product that's going to have customers and the investors, they're going to want to make a profit within seven years or so. And um, so you've got to put together that story. And so, so far, to my knowledge, nobody has put together a story for Skyhooks where they're able to get investors and actually start doing it. But um, it's, it's always in discussion because it is definitely in the realm of feasibility. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Greg. Since the internet has become such an integral part to all of our society, do you envision us attempting to create an interplanetary internet? Yeah, that's a cool question and absolutely we will. Um, I, one of my favorite sci-fi books is called A Fire Upon the Deep. It was written by a computer science professor, Werner Vinge. He's also the person who coined the term, the technological singularity. People talk about the singularity, which we think might happen in this century where suddenly you have this runaway explosion of artificial intelligence. Well, he was the person that coined that term. And in his book, A Fire Upon the Deep, he talked about a galactic internet. And um, of course you got all these problems with speed of light and so forth. Um, but it was really cool how this concept of data and internet was integral to his concept of super advanced civilizations throughout the galaxy. 
And, um, but even within our solar system, that's gonna be an absolutely mandatory thing. Uh, there are people working on these ideas already. I used to have some friends who were working on the standards for interplanetary data communications. And, um, and I think, I think uh, so I, I told you what I think the, are the first two business cases in space, landing pads to support lunar operations, um, rocket fuel to support boosting commsats. Of course, there's a lot of other technologies for supporting science exploration. Um, but I think the third one is gonna be gigantic antennas in earth orbit to support the internet. Um, because the, uh, there's only so much data you can squeeze through fiber optics before you start to melt the glass. There's, there's really a limit in physics and we're starting to get to that limit. And once you hit the limit of what you can put through fibers, then you have to start exponentially rapidly increasing the number of fibers that cross the ocean and the internet will not be able to keep up. I mean, we will not be able to keep up with the growth of the data demand within a couple of decades, according to current projections. And so how do you go beyond fiber optics? What is the next technology? Well, this is why people like Elon Musk and um, Amazon and others are talking about these mega constellations in low earth orbit. So these mega constellations will be able to extend the, the growth of the internet for a couple of decades. But the problem is they're too low. The, uh, the beam spots are too small and they fly by too fast and you can't get enough, um, enough space. Well, it's called um, angular diversity. You can't reuse the same frequencies from the same beam spot at enough different angles. And so I think ultimately we're gonna have to go to gigantic phased arrays antennas in geostationary orbit. And if you have a giant platform with enough phased array elements. We're talking about a, an antenna that's the diameter of three football fields, um, too big to launch on a rocket. But if you can build an antenna out of phased array elements with hundreds of thousands of elements, then you could have a multi-beam forming antenna that can beam in 100,000 different directions on all the same frequencies at the same time, each beam with a different data stream. And so you can have N, antennas on the ground talking to n antennas in space so you get you get n squared i mean not exactly but it scales like n squared um, with the number of times that you can reuse the same frequencies from each spot on the earth and so i've run the numbers on this and this kind of a system will extend the growth of the internet to the end of the century and um and then by the end of the century you i don't know I've, you may have run out of options or you're going to need some new advanced physics. But, um, but I think that there, that is going to be the third uh, killer app for space resources after landing pads, uh, rocket fuel, then it's going to be building giant antennas using materials that you mined in space because you can't launch the material fast enough to build the antennas fast enough to keep up with the growth of the data demands. So I think that'll be the third killer app. And then the fourth killer app will be beamed energy from space. By the time you get to making antennas in space, you're just a short hop away from having a full supply chain and then you can beam the energy and then you're there, then you've got your full supply chain in space. So I do think that is on the critical path to our future. That's excellent, thank you very much. Um, I think we're nearing the end of our time. So I think it's about time to wrap it up. Uh, I just wanna say thank you very much. To Dr. Metzger, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. This oh, it's is... my, my pleasure. And I love interacting with your team every year. You have such a great group of people. And honestly, when I talk about what students can do, I talk about your I talk about the University of Alabama robotics team every time. You're the you're the greatest example I know of stellar achievements and really contributing to space. And I, I know that y'all are gonna have amazing careers because of this education that you're getting. And so thanks to Dr. Ricks for the great job he's doing. It's just the primo example of what people should be doing all over the world. So um, my hat is off to you all. Thanks, Phil. Really appreciate your time and your willingness to talk to us tonight. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you and your family stay safe. All right, thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Everyone, please fill out the attendance poll. It's in the chat before you leave. Thank you. Everyone have a good night.